let us open up tonight with also the verse Luke 6 verse 38 Luke 6 verse 38 give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom for with the same measure that ye meet withal it shall be measured to you again that is such a precious promise this is a promise especially as we're studying about ministry to the rich and ministry of healing if they will take this to heart it will give them courage to give what the Lord has given to them in the ministry of healing pages 209 to 216 was our assignment for tonight and it's ministry to the rich I'm going to start out with the paragraph 209 it says so today God is seeking for souls among the high as well as the low there are many like Cornelius men whom he desires to connect with his church their sympathies are with the Lord's people but the ties that bind them to the world hold them firmly it requires moral courage for these men to take their position with the lowly ones special effort should be made for these souls who are in so great danger because of their responsibilities and associations so just that paragraph alone tells us that it's the lowly ones that accept salvation because they they feel a need in question one of the study guide the question is in spite of their riches and worldly honor what are the rich longing for page 210 says much is said concerning our duty to the neglected poor should not some attention be given to the neglected rich many look upon this class as hopeless and they do little to open the eyes of those who blinded and dazzled by the glitter of earthly glory have lost eternity out of their reckoning thousands of wealthy men have gone to their graves unwarned but indifferent as they may appear many among the rich are soul burdened he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver nor he that loveth abundance with increase that's so true the more you have the more you want continuing on it says riches and worldly honor cannot satisfy the soul many among the rich are longing for some divine assurance some spiritual hope many long for something that will bring an end to the monotony of their aimless lives many in official life feel their need of something which they have not few among them go to church for they feel that they receive little benefit the teaching they hear does not touch the heart shall we make no personal appeal to them ministry of healing 210 paragraph 2 so may God help us that our church services are not like the ones that they've been to where the the preaching and teaching did not touch the heart all right question two it says because they are often indulging in ruinous habits what message should we especially bring to the rich it says here among the victims of want and sin are found those who were once in possession of wealth men of different vocations and different stations in life have been overcome by the pollutions of the world by the use of strong drink by the indulgence of lust and have fallen under temptation while these fallen ones demand pity and help should not some attention be given to those who have not yet descended to these depths but who are setting their feet in the same path continuing on it says they need to have their attention called to the principles of temperance not in a narrow or arbitrary way but in the light of God's great purpose for humanity could the principles of true temperance thus be brought before them there are very many of the higher classes who would recognize their value and give them a hearty acceptance so here we see again that the entering wedge is the health reform true temperance 
abstaining totally from those things that are harmful and using judiciously those things that are good. Continuing on, Ministry of Healing 211, it says, We should show these persons the result of harmful indulgences in lessening physical, mental, and moral power. Help them to realize their responsibility as stewards of God's gifts. Show them the good that they could do with the money that they now spend for that which does them only harm. Present the total abstinent pledge asking that the money they would otherwise spend for liquor, tobacco, or like indulgences be devoted to the relief of the sick poor or for the training of children and youth for usefulness in the world. To such an appeal not many would refuse to listen. Question 3, it says, to fill in the blanks, paragraph 3 of 211, it says, The cup most difficult to carry is not the cup that is empty, but the cup that is full to the brim. It is this that needs to be most carefully balanced. Affliction and adversity bring disappointment and sorrow, but it is prosperity that is most dangerous to spiritual life. Continuing on, it says, Often prayer is solicited for those who are suffering from illness or adversity, but our prayers are most needed by the men entrusted with prosperity and influence. So, this is interesting. Our prayers are most needed by the men entrusted with prosperity and influence. Because these these are the people that Satan is trying to tie their hands up in working with God with their money. They don't realize that this money belongs to God. Ministry of Healing 2.12, paragraph 2, it says, In the valley of humiliation, where men feel their need and depend on God to guide their steps, there is comparative safety. But the man who stands, as it were, on a lofty pinnacle, and who, because of their position, are supposed to possess great wisdom, these are in greatest peril. Unless such men make God their dependence, they will surely fall. Question 4 says, Since a casual approach will not be adequate, what is the key to working with the wealthy? Page 213. It says, They need to have their eyes turned from the vanity of material things to behold the preciousness of of the enduring riches. They need to learn the joy of giving, the blessedness of being co-workers with God. The Lord bids us, charge them that are rich in this world that they trust not in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So this is something that is a direct command from inspiration, that we are to talk to them, we're to charge them, meaning ask them, implore them with the thought that they are responsible for this money and it, and it belongs to God. It says, some are especially fitted for the higher classes. These should seek wisdom from God to know how to reach these persons, to have not merely a casual acquaintance with them, but by personal effort and living faith to awaken them to the needs of the soul, to lead them to a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. Many suppose that in order to reach the higher classes, a manner of life and method of work must be adopted that will be suited to their fastidious tastes. An appearance of wealth, costly edifices, expensive dress and surroundings, conformity to worldly customs, the artificial polish of fashionable society, classical culture, the graces of oratory are thought to be essential. This is an error. The way of worldly policy is not God's way of reaching the higher classes. That which will reach them effectually is a consistent, unselfish, 
presentation of the gospel of Christ. So, benefiting them, not seeking any return, just as we would the poor, unselfishly presenting the gospel of Christ. So how should we approach the rich? In Ministry of Healing 214, paragraph 1, it says, The experience of the Apostle Paul in meeting the philosophers of Athens has a lesson for us. In presenting the gospel before the court of Areopagus, Paul met logic with logic, science with science, philosophy with philosophy. The wisest of his hearers were astonished and silenced. His words could not be controverted. But the effort bore little fruit. Few were led to accept the gospel. Henceforth, Paul adopted a different manner of labor. He avoided the elaborate arguments and discussions of theories, and in simplicity pointed men and women to Christ as the Savior of sinners. Writing to the Corinthians of his work among them, he said, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or with wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. So this is wonderful um, testimony that Paul could give to us that we can learn from his experience that it's not in being able to give excellent speeches or to you know, be able to have logic and the right answer, but to be filled with the Spirit and to present Christ and Him crucified. That is where he saw his conversions. And he learned the lesson uh, the hard way through experience. And again in his letter to Romans he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 1 verse 16. All right, question five. It says, when the wealthy realized what the Lord expects of them, what will be the result? says, If those who are workers together with Him will do their duty bravely and faithfully, God will convert men who occupy responsible places, men of intellect and influence. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, many will be led to accept the divine principles. When it is made plain that the Lord expects them as His representatives to relieve suffering humanity, Many will respond and will give of their means and their sympathies for the benefit of the poor. As their minds are thus drawn away from their own selfish interests, many will surrender themselves to Christ. With their talents of influence and means, they will gladly unite in the work of beneficence with a humble missionary who was God's agent in their conversion. By a right use of their earthly treasures, They will lay up for themselves a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. When converted to Christ, many will become agencies in the hand of God to work for others of their own class. They will feel that a dispensation of the gospel is committed to them for those who have made this world their all. Time and money will be consecrated to God. Talent and influence will be devoted to the work of of winning souls to Christ. Okay, that is the end of the chapter in Ministry to the Rich. And let's take that seriously and not be thinking that they have everything and, and they don't feel a need because, because some do feel a need. And the Holy Spirit is there ready to put efficiency in the words that we say in their minds it's us that need to go and say a word to not be afraid to talk to people especially when we have the Holy Spirit inspiring us 
to talk to this person or that person and giving us words. We need to go with confidence. Okay, now Les is going to give us summary on digestion. All right, good evening. We do a presentation for everyone that comes to White Creek on digestion. Uh, one of the things that we share with them is that we have three body cycles during the day in a 24-hour day, a circadian rhythm. And that body cycle, the first body cycle is body cycle number one. It's uh, the elimination cycle. It starts at 4 o'clock in the morning and it ends at 12 noon. And during this cycle, the body eliminates body producing poisons, waste matter and materials, salts, proteins, uric acids, in liquid, solid, and gaseous forms. So it's, this cycle is very important that when you are in this cycle to eat foods that would aid in that elimination. And those are fruits. Fruits are very cleansing. They're not really a building substance, but they're very cleansing. So it's good to have a lot of fresh, organic, uh, if possible, seasonal fruits and fruit juices you can do. And to support this elimination process. And body cycle number two is the appropriation cycle. Now that cycle starts at 12 noon when the first cycle ends. And it goes to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So during this cycle, the body takes in and stores food and to process for later. The body starts the absorption process of the food. So the, during this time, it's very good to have a high mineral type foods, which is the vegetables. So good, lots of good raw vegetables good salad, a good salad, a good amount. And a good source of starch at this time is also excellent in helping the cycle. So body cycle one starts at four o'clock in the morning, ends at 12 noon. Body cycle number two starts at 12 noon and goes to four o'clock in the afternoon. And wh when I bring this up, it's the fact that to show that the body, the body's metabolism is peak in the morning and it's waning, it's going down as the day goes on. And it's trying to prepare itself for the third cycle. So it is shutting down the longer the day goes. So it's sometimes I meet people that, that eat two meals a day, when we support two meals a day, because we've done it for 38 years, but they like to eat their meals as late as possible in the day. and. Uh, the later you eat your, your noon meal, the closer you get to the end of that cycle, the less energy the body has for digestion. So yes, you feel full later. You don't get hungry later. But the reasons are is that the body's having a harder time digesting and assimilating the foods the later you eat in that cycle. Body cycle number three. Now, body cycle number three starts at 8 o'clock at night. Now, if you remember, body cycle number two ended at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So, there is no cycle between 4 o'clock in the afternoon and 8 o'clock at night. And there's actually no metabolic need. There's, there's nothing for metabolism needed at that time really the only people that need to eat something is somebody that has worked extremely hard or has a problem with hypoglycemia, a low blood sugar problem. And then they need to eat, like the spirit prophecy mentions, a, a piece of fruit, maybe a piece of zwieback, something very light, very easily digested. And if possible, don't eat it all. It's, you'll feel much better You'll handle the foods that you've already eaten much better. You'll sleep much better. You won't be waking up as often in the night to go to the bathroom. All kinds of things. 
So body cycle number three starts at 8 o'clock at night and ends at 4 in the morning when body cycle number one starts. This cycle is the assimilation cycle. It's the time to heal, build, re-energize, repair. Um, so during this cycle, the body assimilates all the foods that are given during the day. And if you remember, people used to say you need to eat your beans and rice together, your corn and something together, to mix your grains and your beans and stuff to get complete protein. But that's not necessary if you're eating plenty of uh, complex carbohydrates because your body is storing those proteins, break them down to the amino acids, storing them, and then later mixes them together to get complete protein to uh, reconstruct and rebuild the body. So during this last cycle is when the body rebuilds, reconstruction, regeneration of the entire body. An example I might give you is we get a new stomach lining every two days. So all the lining is constantly being replaced. So it needs that rest time. If you're eating a third meal, it's going to interfere with that rest time because digestion it is the hardest function of the body. So if you're throwing in a meal, a late meal, that uh, when the body's trying to shut down and you're throwing in the hardest thing it has to do anyways at the wrong time, you're going to get a lot of, you'll have a lot of problems. You'll find yourself sometimes waking up uh, tireder than when you went to bed. We teach about digestion because uh, most people have a problem with digestion when they come and I have a pet peeve and that's eating between meals so we're trying to explain to them why not to eat between meals why not to drink water with their meals all the different little simple things that we know but make a very great and vast Im improvement to people when they stop doing them so we show them that digestion is a process. It's not just something that happens. It's not that you just sit down and eat and a digestion happens and then you kind of eat when you want and it doesn't matter what times you eat or if you're regular or any of those things. We show the importance of trying to aid digestion as much as possible. So when you put a piece of food in your mouth at any time, that starts the process of digestion. This is why you'll see in the spirit prophecy, it tells us not to let a morsel of food pass our lips between meals. And it says not a peanut should pass our lips between meals. And all these different references. Because we have started a process. Now that process takes time. When you put the piece of food in your mouth, that starts the process of digestion. By the time the stomach is empty will be usually four hours. Usually all food will leave the stomach within four hours. So the stomach should be empty after four hours. Now certain meats and cheeses and different things will stay in the stomach longer. If you use a lot of fat, oil and stuff in your meals to make it stay in the stomach longer. But you put that piece of food in your mouth, your pyloric valve closes the bottom of the stomach, starts the process of digestion. Uh, saliva is uh, secreted so it will alkalinize the mouth and the esophagus and the stomach lining will produce a little bicarbonate of soda to alkalinize the top of the stomach for the complex carbohydrates to be digested. And the bottom of the stomach will start to produce hydrochloric acid. And it'll take about 20 minutes before the hydrochloric acid is built to a 1% solution. And then whatever was not digested or whatever was broken down by the saliva uh, is now stopped and it works on protein. So carbohydrates, mouth, protein, stomach. And then eventually it will come out of the stomach, go into the small intestines. And that's where the rest of the protein, the rest of the carbohydrates are assimilated in the duodenum and uh, then fat is taken care of. So here's an amazing process. But what happens if you get a little hungry or you're tempted by a little bit and you throw a piece of candy in your mouth or you grab just a little bit of something throw it in your mouth or maybe a banana just 
something small that would digest easy. Will it affect your digestion? Well, I have two examples. Here's a study that was done on four nurses. This was done at the Washington Sanitarium, and four nurses were given a standard breakfast, cereal with cream, bread and butter, cooked fruit, one egg, and a glass of berry milk. So the berry milk was so that they could x-ray their stomachs to see when they emptied. And all their stomachs were emptied in four hours. Now later, these same nurses were given a duplicate meal, so later meaning a couple days later, given a duplicate meal, but two hours after their breakfast, additional food was given. And this is the results. These same nurses had the same meal, but two hours later, nurse number one was given an ice cream cone. Her breakfast stayed in her stomach for six hours. It was there for six hours instead of four hours. It was there two hours longer than the day before. Nurse number two, two hours later, had a nut butter sandwich. So we're talking peanut butter, almond butter, some type of nut butter. Nine hours later, breakfast was still in her stomach. So breakfast was still there, but then there was a nut butter sandwich, and it was still in her stomach for nine hours. It normally leaves in four hours. If food is not out of the stomach at the proper time, then it starts to ferment. It starts to decay. It starts to create poisons instead of nourishment. Nurse number three, two hours later, had a pumpkin pie and a glass of milk. Nine hours later, food was still in her stomach. Nurse number four, two hours later, ate one banana. Eight hours later, food was still in her stomach. Now, when this takes place, this is this is where you, you're getting, you're, you're not getting proper nutrient. Whatever nutrient you're getting has been fermented or altered in some way, so it's not proper. Uh, fats can go ran rancid, and, and um, you can get just um, very poor quality protein and things because of, of this. And now you, you've built the foundation for disease. So the, they um, also did an experiment in New England. Uh, a, healthy, a healthy nurse was given an ordinary breakfast at 7.30 in the morning. Barium was added with the breakfast so they could x-ray and see when the stomach emptied. Four pieces of fudge were given during the day. One at 9 a.m., one at 11 a.m., one at 2 p.m., one at 4 p.m. Lunch was eaten at 12 and supper at 6. The results were that nine hours after breakfast, the x-ray showed breakfast was still in the stomach. Thirteen and one half hours later, the x-ray showed that breakfast was still there. But what else was there? Four pieces of fudge, lunch, and supper. And this same nurse digested the same meal without the fudge during the day. The stomach was empty in four hours. So when you have all that crammed into your stomach in a very hot acid environment and starting to decay, this food is rotting. This is where when somebody wakes up in the morning and their breath is so bad you can't hardly uh, face them. This is from decayed food. This is not from bad teeth or, or bad you know, they, halitosis. This is not from the mouth. It's from the intestinal tract. Um, so uh, digestion is very, very important. All the little things we find in the Spirit of Prophecy um, as, as directions to digestion are very, very important, you know, um, because they have profound effects on our health. And uh, we, need, we, we need to follow those instructions. 
uh, to the letter and we will find our health springing forth speedily. Okay, thank you. That study is found in the book Abundant Health by Julius Gilbert White and as medical missionaries we should be memorizing those studies because it is very profound and very convincing to people to help them because people a lot of people especially when you're working with people from the world that don't know the spirit of prophecy we should be doing it because it's a thus saith the Lord but the world needs facts and statistics okay we're going to go into our back to Eden book and we're on page 152 we need to do the next few herbs the first herb is lungwort and of course the name of the herb just gives it away what it's good for it's excellent for the lungs it's the uh, medical properties is an expectorant which is makes it so that you can expel mucus from the lungs and down here under the description it says that it's the most valuable remedy for coughs influenza catarrh colds and lung troubles be bleeding lungs even and all bronchial troubles okay let's go down to mandrake and we had a lot of mandrake when we lived in Arkansas. It says down here at the bottom that mandrake is a potent herb that should be taken with care and that there are other herbs that can give you the same result and are much safer. But Jethro Kloss mentions here, it says in chronic liver disease, it has no equal. So under extreme situations for the liver, I would say I would give it a try. It says small doses given frequently should be used in order to prevent severe purgative action. It says steep a teaspoonful in a pint of boiling water and take a teaspoonful of this tea at a time. Children less according to age. So that's quite a small dose. So need to take precaution with the mandrake or may apple what we know it by okay the next herb is marjoram and I like to use marjoram as a seasoning with my squash soup but it does have medicinal properties it says that it is a good tonic it's very effective when you combine it with chamomile and gentian excellent for sour stomach loss of appetite cough increases the flow of urine uh, it's good for headaches, indigestion, and if you take it hot, it can produce perspiration. The next herb is the marshmallow. And on this one, you can use the root and the leaves. So the first property mentioned is a diuretic. It says, as a poultice, it is excellent for sore and inflamed parts since it is very soothing and lubricating. So it's an emollient says for lung troubles hoarseness cough bronchitis diarrhea dysentery says put a teaspoon in a cup of water simmer it for 10 minutes let stand till cool and drink one to two cupfuls a day a large mouthful at a time so some of these herbs we think you know we just drink it up all at once and it's going to do us good for the day but a lot of times you want to spread these things out throughout the day says the tea is also good to bathe sore inflamed eyes very soothing and healing to any inflamed condition of the bowels I've been uh, having a new client come to uh, get massages and she has colitis and has been asking me about uh, what she can do for that and this so this is interesting it's very good to heal any inflamed condition of the bowel so I have to remember that marshmallow gravel and all kidney diseases it's good for the root is sometimes used to increase milk in nursing mothers the next one is a master wart and the part used is the root and the seed this is a useful remedy for colds fevers 
increasing the flow of urine, gravel in the kidneys, colic, scanty menstruation with painful cramps, dyspepsia, dropsy, epilepsy, spasm, asthma, apoplexy. Okay, so its properties are antispasmodic. And that was the master wart. Milkweed, which is a very familiar plant to a lot of us. Uh, the part here used is the root. So it's an emetic and a purgative, alterative, a diuretic, and a tonic. So it says it's a splendid for female complaints, bowel, and kidney troubles. Okay, the next one is a mint. Now, this is not peppermint. This is the the wild mint that you see. It's it's a large mint, and it's also called horse mint or American horse mint. And the part used is the leaves of the tops. It says it's very quieting and soothing and eases pain. Mistletoe has a caution. It says the berries are poisonous and should not be eaten. Large doses have an adverse effect on the heart. Take this herb with care and preferably under proper supervision. So it says that this is a different plant from the American mistletoe. It is a fine nervine, effective in epilepsy, convulsions, hysteria, delirium, and St. Vitus dance. It raises the blood pressure and speeds up the pulse. So use only one teaspoon to a pint of boiling water. The next one is motherwort, and its first property is antispasmodic. It says it's excellent result to promote the menstrual flow. It is also useful in other female troubles. It should be taken warm. It's very useful in nervous complaints, fainting, heart flutters, cramps, convulsions, hysteria, delirium, and sleeplessness. Good for liver infections and suppressed urine. Hot fomentation wrung out of the strong tea will relieve cramps and pain due to painful menstruation. A remedy for colds, especially chest colds, kills worms. Has an excellent effect if taken during pregnancy. It says take one cup a day using only a swallow at a time. When using the tincture, take one half teaspoon three times daily in a glass of water. Okay, mugwort is our next herb. And it says the leaves and flowers are full of virtue. It says here mugwort is very useful in overcoming inflammatory swellings, gravel and stones in the kidneys and bladder to increase the flow of urine and for fevers and gout. After using a poultice of chickweed or slippery elm, thoroughly bathe the affected part for some time with the hot tea made by steeping a tablespoonful of mugwort to a pint of boiling water for 20 minutes. It says bruises or whitlows or felons, those are the sores that you get around your cuticles, abscesses, carbuncles, and sometimes even tumors will yield to this treatment if it is continued. Good for rheumatism and gout. Acute pain in the bowels and stomach can quickly be relieved by drinking the warm infusion and applying hot fomentations wrung out of the boiling infusion. Okay, mullen is quite prevalent. We all know mullen. It's very soft, light, large leaves that grow with, and then they flower. Their flowers are yellow. This is the part used is the leaves, the flower, and the roots. It says, the root has been successfully used for many years in asthma. For this purpose, burn the root and inhale the fumes. A tea of the leaves is very valuable in asthma, croup, bronchitis, all lung afflictions, bleeding from the lungs, difficult breathing, and hay fever. A tea made from the flowers will induce sleep and relieve pain, and in large doses act as a laxative. The freshly crushed flowers will remove warts. Now this is mullen we're talking about. Fomentations wrung out from hot tea made from the leaves are helpful for inflamed piles, ulcers, tumors, mumps, acute inflammation of the tonsils, and sore throat. Fomentations are excellent in any glandular swelling. 
This is a splendid remedy when taken internally for dropsy, catarrh, or swollen joints. This is excellent painkiller without being habit forming. That was the mullen. Now mustard, it says here, it's, this is the common yellow ground mustard that is used so much in food, even though it is harmful when used in this way. Mustard is an irritant and it is not good to use it as a food. Mustard is excellent when put in a foot bath to draw the blood to the lower part of the body in congestion of the lungs or head. It is excellent to use in a poultice for pneumonia, bronchitis, and other diseases of the respiratory tract. Mustard plaster is also excellent applied over the kidneys in irritation of the kidneys. A good mustard plaster is made as follows, one part mustard and four parts whole wheat flour. Make into a paste by mixing with warm water. Have it thick enough to nicely spread on a piece of cloth. If the mustard is very strong, be careful not to blister the skin. When the burning becomes too uncomfortable, the mustard plaster should be removed. After you remove it, you um, cleanse the skin, making sure that there's no mustard left. And next one is myrrh. It's one of my favorite herbs. And the part used is the powdered gum or resin. It's an antiseptic as its first property. And the um, antiseptic is killing germs and viruses and things that might get into wounds. It says an ancient Bible remedy, still in use today and one of the best. It is valuable as a tonic and stimulant for bronchial and lung diseases. Excellent for pyorrhea as it is antiseptic and very healing. So if you have trouble with your gums, make a little mouthwash out of it. So this is, it is also an excellent remedy for ulcers, piles, hemorrhoids, and for bathing bed sores or any sores on the body. Made into an ointment with equal parts of golden seal, it is excellent for piles and hemorrhoids. Or the tea can be used for these conditions as a wash. So if you don't want to make a salve, just make a tea and then wash the areas with the tea. It's also very effective for gangrene. It's used for cough, asthma, tuberculosis, and all chest affections. And it diminishes the mucus discharge. This is myrrh. The next one is nettle. And the common name is stinging nettle. The entire plant is used. It says a poultice of the green steeped leaves will relieve pain. However, such a poultice will raise blisters if kept on too long. It will kill and expel worms. For chronic rheumatism, take the bruised leaves and rub on the skin. Excellent for reducing in combination with c rack. Tea made from the root will cure dropsy in the first stages and will stop hemorrhages from the urinary organs, lungs, intestines, nose, and stomach. The boiled leaves applied externally will stop bleeding almost immediately. Nettle tea is an excellent hair tonic and will bring back the natural color of the hair. Use as the last rinse when shampooing. Make a cup of the tea by steeping a teaspoonful in a cup of boiling water for 30 minutes. Dip the fingers in and thoroughly massage the scalp. This will cure dandruff. It is well to boil the leaves in vinegar for this purpose. In the summer, when you can get the green leaves, cook them like spinach. They are a splendid blood purifier. It says old plants may cause kidney damage if eaten without being cooked. So you shouldn't eat them raw unless uh, they're very young. And the last one we're going to do tonight is nutmeg. And it says here that it is mildly hallucinogenic. Nutmeg is no longer commonly used for medicinal purposes as there are other less toxic herbs having greater effect on the system. Serious symptoms of poisoning can result from eating only a few of the nutmegs. So it's one of those spices that we're to refrain from using because of its irritating effects also on the stomach. And that's it for the Back to Eden. Next week 
we are going to do 162 to 172. Anybody have any comments on any of these herbs that they might have, you know, looked up and on the internet and had some other books possibly that they could give us some extra information that might be interesting? Or a testimony that you might have had with herbs or anything you'd like to say now. This is a time. We have a few minutes. Sister Kathy. Yes. I'm with the Waynesville group, and across the street we've had this young boy we've been talking to for quite a few months trying to get him to come to church and everything, and he works at Walmart. Well, he texted me that he cut his finger almost off on the tip of his middle finger. Mm-hmm. And so I was explaining to him a little bit about comfrey. Mm-hmm. He did this on like a fr- Thursday, and he came over to the church on Sabbath because I had made him some and brought it to him. And he was so impressed. He was so impressed with comfrey. He said that his finger had been filling him with pain. And he said the minute he put that on, within 10 seconds, all that pain was gone away. And he did it just like I told him to do it that evening. And, oh, he w- I mean, he just rants and raves on comfrey now. He is so sold on comfrey. <laughs> it's a wonderful herb, isn't it? Yeah, his, and I don't have any experiences with these with anybody, but I did want to share that. So that was a great medical missionary thing, so we're to get him to come to the church, and now he promised he would be there in two weeks. Oh, good. Yep. Praise the Lord. But he was sold on comfrey, and he told everybody about it. I tell you, it's beautiful. But I was thankful to the Lord for that. I told him it's always the Lord through the herb. That's wonderful. Well, you can share that testimony when you come our guests that we're going to have at the me- at the Medical Missionary Seminar in May. I will. Because we're going to have testimony time and educate the people that come to the classes. Any other testimonies or, or thoughts about any of these herbs or anything that the Lord has done special for you this past few weeks? Okay, we're going to give our assignment for Class 18 next week. Going to read Ministry of Healing 219 to 224 in the sick room and also read and go through the herbs, page 162 to 172 and back to Eden. And we're also going to have another talk next week by Les and going to be on why free oils are just as bad for you or worse than sugar. I put a website up for you to go to on the assignment page on audio SDARM on the page of uh, the medical missionary phone class under assignments. If you go to assignments and go down to class 18, there'll be a page for you to read. And it is a discussion uh, by Agatha Thrash on vitamin B12. It's very interesting. I would like for everyone to read it because you're always going to get the question, well, what about vitamin B12? You know, you're a vegetarian. If you want me to be a vegetarian, do I need to be concerned about B12? This will give you your answer. And also, if you're questioning, why is my B12 low while I'm because I'm a vegan? And it will answer that. It's very interesting. So I would like for everyone to read through that and our memory verses for next week is psalms 107 verses 17 through 20 psalm 107 verses 17 through 20 mark 16 verse 18 mark 16 verse 18 john 14 verse 14 john 14 verse 14 John 12, verse 26. John 12, verse 26. And to close, we're go- I'm going to read the, the other four memory verses for last week. 
Mark 14, verse 7, it says, For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. James 1, verse 27, says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And James 1, verse 5, says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now that's a promise right there. If we lack wisdom, we just have to ask for it. It's his will. We don't have to think, well, maybe, you know, he's not going to give it to us. It's for sure he will give it to us. Especially if we are out to help the poor and the needy and to have a word ready to speak for those in need. Luke 6 verse 35 says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So is there anybody else that would like to make any comments before we close? Okay, let us bow. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege of being able to contemplate this work. We want to do more than just contemplate it. We really do want to reach out to those. We want to have an answer for those that have questions. We want to have wisdom. More than knowledge, we want to have wisdom, which is that practical understanding and ability to, to do things. That when people ask us, we will be able to help them and they will be impressed like the man did with uh, Sister Sharon and the Comfrey. We thank you so much for that experience. Do pray, Lord, that each and every one of us will have an ear open to hear those that are crying out in need or those that are impressed to ask us questions. Just give us grace. We don't deserve it, and we want to give you the glory. We do pray that you'll keep us till next week. Help us to do the true medical missionary work of lending and not hoping to receive, to loving our enemies, and helping the poor and the sick and the widows. Help us to do that, not because we are earning our way, but because we love you and we thank you for everything that you have done for us. Change our hearts. Give us a soft heart and put your love within us. Help us to be forgiving and to be ready to give a smile and lend a hand. Forgive us for our shortcomings in the past. Help us to go forward with courage in the future. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, God bless.